thank you, James, for coming to, coming to the show today and for giving up your time. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce you. You're an author and president and CEO of Hogan and Associates. And it's in particular, we're looking to talk about misinformation and regarding climate change and your book, The Climate Cover-Up, The Crusade to Deny Global Warming. But before we start, I just want to know what got you interested into the subject of climate change? Yeah, well, it, it started in about uh, 2005 and it was kind of accidental. We were just um, doing a new website. I owned, uh, uh, at the time, my, uh, a very large public relations company in Vancouver. And we were redoing our website and the people in charge of the, the relaunch of the site suggested we do a kind of a community service section. <clears throat> and we just kind of brainstormed and eventually the decision was made to do it on climate change. So we started to uh, uh, work on the material for the site and it, that basically started to get me interested in it and kind of alarmed by it. And I became fascinated by this puzzle for me that uh, how was it possible that you could have all of this evidence from all of the leading um, climate scientists in the world and still be doing so little about it and, and there being this kind of debate about whether or not it was real. And so kind of, you know, was basically just stumbling into it. Mm. No, no, I, I agree. It's, it's quite uh, confusing why, why there's still so much debate about it. Like you say, when there's so many, so much evidence that suggests climate change, well, I'm, I'm not going to get to there yet. So uh, in your book, the climate cover up, you talk about lemmings and lifeguards. Now, by saying that, people might think, what's he talking about? But you give a great analogy in your book. Do you mind to elaborate the connection between lemmings and lifeguards and climate change? Yeah, it's a, um, I guess, <clears throat> um, we, we felt we needed some kind of analogy because it was so complicated. And, and I think it, there's also this problem that most people are fairly honest. Hmm. And most people find it really incredibly difficult to understand how there could be like an organized effort to mislead people about something like this, hmm. like about climate change. And so we, we wanted to basically take a sort of a simple analogy to kind of explain what we were trying um, to argue about this fake debate around climate science. And the, the real point behind the analogy of these uh, lifeguards is that mo these are fake lifeguards. These are people who pretend to be acting in the public interest and, um, and telling people they can dive off the cliff into you know, an ocean that's got rocks in it. <laughs> yeah. and, and they're, and they're basic, and, and it, with the analogy with climate science was you know, look, these, uh, these people who are telling you that climate change isn't happening, they have, there's one thing they have in common, and that is they're not doing climate science. Mm. And most of them, some way or another, are financially connected to the oil and gas industry. Mm. And so you got to watch out for the lifeguards. Yeah. And no. you got to watch out for these fake climate scientists. No, definitely. Definitely. And that comes to my next question. Uh, we live in an information age. We have information all around us. It's very easy to access. Yet there still seems to be so much confusion and debate about climate, climate change. Why do you think that is? <clears throat> well, it's a, I think that's a really, uh, that's an excellent question. That's something that kind of preoccupies me and uh, a number of books that I've, that I've written. Um, part of it is that um, it's much easier for people with, because we live in the, the world of social media, mm. 
it's all it's much easier for people to kind of fall into a rabbit hole and find a whole bunch of people they can make friends with there. <laughs> and so you no. you get these kind of information bubbles yeah. <clears throat> where where people no longer have to hang out on their own with some kind of crazy idea. They can mm -hmm. have like not just thousands, but millions of other people who come to agree with them. You know, QAnon is a, a good example mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. But climate change denial is very much like that. It's basically, uh, it's, it's a conspiracy theory. Mm. It's not science. And, and so, but the, the other thing is people are pretty easy to confuse. You know, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we're busy living our lives and taking care of our families and our responsibilities. We don't have a lot of time to become experts in everything that comes our way. Mm. And so, you know, if if your job and, and really what we found when we when we wrote climate cover up is <clears throat> the whole idea was uh, with climate change denial was to sell doubt mm. to try to convince people that um, climate scientists were biased that, uh, that that essentially the reason that they were doing what they were doing was for research money and that there's a lively debate about whether or not it's even happening. So mm. essentially the, the, the product of climate change denial was doubt. And, and, so, and that's, it's pretty easy to be kind of susceptible to doubt because that's kind of how science works. You yeah. know, we're skeptical, you know, we have open minds and, and we also have this belief that, you know, people are fair-minded and so it's very easy to convince people there's another side to this story, even if there's not. Mm. And so I think that's what ended up happening that uh, people got uh, duped into thinking there was a debate about whether or not climate change was real when there really wasn't one. And unfortunately, mainstream media did as well around the world. For decades, you find the mainstream media kind of uh, using a kind of a model of covering climate change that it was kind of a he said, she said mm. model, like a false equivalency model mm. that kind of, you know, people, it, it appealed to people because people, you know, people feel there are two sides to a story. So, yeah, yeah. and so I think that was part of it. So it took some of the air out of the wind, out of the sails and, and stopped the kind of movement forward towards doing something about climate change. Mm, no, definitely. I mean, that's what I was going to talk about. Um, the, the adage that there's always two sides of the two schools of thought. You, you're going to accept that has an argument being balanced. There can't be one side, surely. There's got to be two sides to everything. Like you say, science is skeptical and it, that's how it advances. One part of your book, where is it called? Uh, junk science where you talk about pat michaels being asked to stand up against the climate change alarmist to bring a balanced account to the argument uh, to the discussion now that sounds credible that sounds very natural what one would expect but as you go on to say in the book it, it's more than that isn't it can you elaborate on that why <clears throat> yeah um I mean, it's basically what we're taught when, when we go to college or university. Mm. Uh, we're taught to kind of look at both sides of the of the story. We're taught to, um, you know, to be civil, to to be open minded, to you know, to be ready to change our mind. You know, that we could be wrong about something, and that's a healthy thing, mm. unless you're dealing with people who are messing with you, unless you're dealing with people who are engaged in propaganda who are kind of taking advantage of that uh, kind of open-mindedness that most of us have. And so um, the climate change is one of those things that, you know, there's, there's other things too, like vaccinations, mm. you know, uh, or masks or all these other things that have become kind of politically polarized, that it's really important for people in this online world on reading a Facebook post to, to stop and start to look really carefully at the credentials of the person mm. 
uh, and the and the background of the of the source of this information that you're consuming, and then look at other sources. And when I did that in you know in the two thousand you know two thousand five uh, when we started Dsmog blog and started writing climate cover up in two thousand nine, what I found was that you have ninety seven percent of 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 atmospheric scientists of climate scientists say that humans are changing the climate in a dangerous way. And then you have people like Pat Michaels who are getting paid by the coal industry saying it's, that it's, it, it's, it's not a problem. Hmm. And what, one of the things we found when, was when we started to look at the credentials of the people uh, who were saying that climate change wasn't a problem was virtually there, there wasn't any of them that were actually doing science. Yeah. That's right. So they, they weren't doing science. They were actually doing PR and I'm a PR guy. So I'm, that kind of stuff makes me really nervous. Mm. So when you've got somebody who's doing PR, who's kind of involved in propaganda, it's, you got to be really careful not to treat them as fairly as you want to treat everyone else. Mm. Um, these people uh, were up to mischief. Mm. And so we started to do research into, you know, who's funding them, uh, what, what, you know, what are their credentials? Hmm. And uh, what we found was there was virtually, you couldn't find, there's hardly anyone in the climate science world that was doing science that was saying that climate change isn't the problem. And on the other hand, you had, you know, uh, the Royal Academy, you had the National Academy of Sciences, you had NOAA, you had NASA, mm. uh, the Royal Society in Canada, virtually every major scientific academy in the world is saying that this is a very serious problem. And then you have these other people who are saying it's not. Start to look closely at them and you realize that they're mainly outliers who are motivated uh, by ideology or by money. Mm. And uh, and, and engaged in a kind of a conspiracy theory yeah, that yeah. climate scientists are trying to pull one over on. Uh, no, uh, you're completely right. Uh, I think it's in your book. Uh, you, there's another analogy, say, on an airplane. If there was n nine en or 90 engineers that said the plane was going to crash, sorry, that the plane was going to crash, and you said, and there was 10 that said it was safe, would you get on the airplane? I think that's the right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. You wouldn't get on the plane. You'd say, I'm going to listen to the 90, not to those 10. Yeah, there's a, you, your mind always thinks, well, what, are they, what if they're the 10 are right? But you wouldn't, you wouldn't take that risk. But that's what we're doing at the moment. We're taking that risk on, like, as you say, scientists who aren't even, uh, research in climate science uh which is very well some of them aren't even science like you said they're pr guys so it's very frightening to think we're being led down a path by people who aren't qualified to to even speak on the subject now another thing you mentioned in your book which i found really really interesting was caleb crane the mention of caleb crane and the chronicling of an oral society oral culture why is that working against climate science, do you think? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, that whole analysis, I think, is uh, a very interesting analysis. And basically, um, it's much easier to, um, it's much easier to manipulate someone who isn't taking a, a lot of time to kind of think about what uh, the formation of their opinions on things. Mm. So reading is a, you know, is a kind of a slow methodical way to gain knowledge. Mm. Uh, you know, doing the kind of research that you should do on the source of whoever it is you're reading is super important. But assuming that you're doing that, mm. what you want to be able to do is actually take the time to think deeply about important subjects yeah. and when you when the when we it seems today we're more interested in sound bites so if we see something i do it all the time hmm. you know uh there's an article that i'm really interested in but it's like an, a one hour read you know 
I don't have an hour to read this, even <laughs> though I'm interested. In it. So I put it aside. I have so many books and mm. so many long articles and it it's just the kind of world we live in mm. and it makes it easier to manipulate us yeah. in this world of kind of fast thinking particularly if you can push people into thinking that the subject matter that we're looking at in the case of climate change is a very good example that climate change isn't something that people like us believe in and if you believe in this, you can't be one of us. You must be one of them. If I can convince you that the whole area of climate change is kind of a liberal scam hmm. and you're kind of a conservative type of person, then eventually I'll carry on a conversation with you for a while that convinces you that this is kind of almost like a tribal issue, hmm. then I can get you to, to believe a whole bunch of false things. And, and that is one of the things that I discovered with climate, with climate cover-up. That's the heart of propaganda. Disinformation mm. is an important part of it, but the tribalizing of science, the kind of us versus them massaging of science mm. essentially uh, makes it really hard for people to, uh, you know, to get a really good grip on what the science is actually trying to tell us. So you see anti-science movements growing and growing largely because people haven't had a, a, enough time to take a deep enough dive into the subject matter. And they've been convinced that they're basically partisan, that it's, they're dealing with partisan mm -hmm. subject matter. So the other thing though, is that the way the media covers, uh, subjects like climate change mm. is in this us versus them way of doing it yeah. and when you do that you basically don't give people the opportunity to go a little bit deeper and to you know to understand that the story is more complicated than it appears right. and so prop one of the tools of propaganda is this oversimplification of subject matter where you're trying to basically convince people it's a debate it's a fight it's partisan it mm. doesn't have anything to do with science and when it is when it you know and there are scientists who are disagreeing with it anyway that all sort of we are kind of psychologically predisposed to buy that kind of mm. narrative so it's not simply just lying to people it is that it's manipulating people because that you know today we understand a lot about social science that we didn't even know in the you know like the beginning of the public relations business started like in 1930 or so mm. when it started they didn't even have they didn't even do uh public opinion polling or focus groups or they didn't really know a lot about social science over the last hundred years we've learned a lot about how people tick. Mm -hmm. And there are some bad actors out there who use that information on behalf of industry to manipulate people into believing things that are false. Mm. No, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the campaign against uh, proving climate science is fake. I mean, we see the snippets of in the US Senate of the senator bringing the snowball in or um, I don't want to mention, I want to get political, but you got snippets like this that all it takes is a person to look at it, glance, think about it, and just dismiss it. But that that snippet stays there. Like I said, these snow, sound bites stay with you unless you're willing to look further. So it is very, extremely dangerous. So I've got two, I've got a, recently had a grandson and I've got one on the way. Me, I'm, I'm worried about them. What do you think is the way forward? How can the, it, I'm sounding partisan now, <laughs> the, the people who don't believe in climate science has been very successful in their campaign to cover up global warming. How can we, how can it be combated? Uh, in a, uh, yeah, and, and I think it is. I mean, I think public opinion is basically on the side of science mm. more than it, than it was. Mm. Um, 
But the fact of the matter is the, the science of how to confuse people mm. about climate change is much more robust and muscular than the science of how to educate people about climate change. So I think um, it seems to me that everybody should be doing something about climate change. And, and I think not just personally, but politically. And I think if everyone is actually doing something mm. politically, the, the main thing to do is to vote for the climate mm. and to uh, not let people get away with climate change denial or, or, you know, pretending to do something when you're not, we really need to demand change mm. <clears throat> and words, public relations does not reduce climate pollution. Mm. Um, you know, neither does uh, do nice political words or policies or mm. agreements or treaties or it's re you really want to watch what's happening to greenhouse gas emissions. Mm. And unfortunately, greenhouse gas emissions in most parts of the world are, you know, not now because of the pandemic, but, you know, setting aside this last year, mm. essentially are rising mm. in spite of all the Paris Agreement and all that. Mm. We need to reverse that. And the, the most important thing that anyone can do is become politically active and yeah. fight for uh, science-based public policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mm. No, definitely. I think sometimes individuals um, uh, feel that they're, they're insignificant, that they can't do nothing as an individual. But what, I think what they don't realize is that en masse, you can do a lot. So really, it's about empowering the individual, is that what you're saying? And, but how do we reach that individual? Because I, I know there's a lot of people who get turned off by science. Yeah, it's... Um... I mean, I do think that not just climate scientists, but anyone who's concerned about the future needs to become better at communicating it. And one of the, I have a friend who has this formula for communications, public communications around, around climate change. And he mm -hmm. says it's basically uh, simple messages repeated frequently by trusted sources. Mm, yeah. and, 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 I, and I think when you look at a simple compelling message, what, what is that? Well, it's in the, in, the, uh, in the case of climate change, that has been the hard part mm. because for so long, people were thinking climate change had something to do with polar bears. Now people are starting to realize it has something to do with extreme weather events. Mm. And so it becomes closer because people have this, if, if, you can't, uh, if you can't convince me in a message mm. that what you're talking about is close to me in space and time, that's problematic. So we need to be able to talk about climate change you know, in, the, in a way that affects people in, in their personal lives. It's not yeah. about polar bears, mm. right? It's, you know, it, it's about your health. It's about, it's about your safety. It's about your economic stability. Mm. You know, it's about, uh, it's not, you're not gonna see the ocean come up and like bury or, or flood your house probably uh, tomorrow. Uh, that's a bit further away, but there's a whole bunch of other things with food security and, mm. um, and just the kind of social, we can see from the pandemic that, you know, it's global, you know, it gives us a good example about how easy it is for things to start to break, mm, you know, social systems, political systems, economic mm. systems, things are fragile. And the other thing you can learn by looking at the pandemic, it seems to me is that weirdly, it just doesn't seem like there's anybody in charge. Mm. You know, it's not like we can sort of lean yeah. on somebody to fix this for us, mm. right? And so I think all of us need to become kind of almost like soldiers demanding change from political leaders and from community leaders and, and, and fighting against this kind of nonsense 
from these oil and gas industry um, uh, spokespeople, essentially. Mm. Uh, one, the other thing is, it seems to me that like, there's been a lot of research done on the power of repetition. Mm. Mm. And just the research shows that if you repeat something frequently enough, mm. you can even change the mind of someone who doesn't trust you as the source of that repetition. And so just pounding away at the idea of there being a debate about climate change over the years changed mm. people's, it changed the conversation. Mm. It changed people's views. It created doubts, even in people's minds who shouldn't mm. be confused. And so I think we need to use the power of repetition to educate people. And we need to get the messages right. We need to get the, um, uh, we need to, uh, you know, put in place the strategy to get the message repeated a lot. And we need to get the right people on both on the political left and the political right mm. out there, the people that people trust talking about this. So ministers and weathermen and, and uh, people that are, that are not seen to be kind of politically biased. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the more we do that, and that is being done, there mm. are yeah. literally millions of people around the world doing that. And those mm. people are, are doing the work of God when it comes mm. to, you know, help fixing the climate crisis. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. Like you say, repetition, you, politicians use it all the time. They use repeat something three times and it just sits there. And you're very right. You need trusted sources to give that message across. And at the moment, we, guys, to politicians, people have lost a lot of trust. So it's it's rebuilding that element of trust in people who uh, who've got the who are thinking of the society rather than themselves. Well, thank you, James. I really appreciate you giving up your time. You're a true gentleman, and it's been a real pleasure to to meet you. I've really enjoyed your book. It's really, really been an eye opener. Uh, I wish I'd read it a lot earlier. <laughs> so, but thank this, you. You should you get a copy of this. Which one? This This is my new book. Okay, I'll definitely get that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> right. You're an idiot. <laughs> no. <laughs> thank you very much, James. You're. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and a real eye opener. Hope people hope people see it. Thank you and and wake up to what's really happening. All right. Take you care. have you have a great day and thank you very much again.